Hey, yeah, so this is just a, a very brief presentation about how the Zapatistas assemble and build autonomy. Uh, and it's really just a way to get us a starting point. Uh, so maybe we can start uh, being invited to uh, think about geography differently and think about power differently and how we might do things. And so I want to start off with this map, which is a map of southern Mexico. It's of Zapatista territory in the state of Chiapas. Uh, you can see the state of Oaxaca to uh, closer to the left and Veracruz. Uh, Chiapas is the southernmost most state in Mexico. Uh, it's, it's part of the Maya world together with the, uh, so much of the south of Mexico and Guatemala. And as you can see, the Zapatista territories, um, they're, five, they're caracoles, which are their zones of government. They don't have one headquarter, they, they have it dispersed. And um, today in 2022, they have 12, but that for a long time they had five. And so this is when they had five caracoles. And as you can tell, the reason why I wanna show this map is because they completely trespass the borders the municipal borders, the state borders, even the nation state borders that have been imposed. And so what the Zapatistas has done is create a geography that makes sense to them. So they talk a lot about that. They have their own geographies and their own calendars. There are many other geographies, many other calendars, many other worlds. We really are just taught about the one, the dominant one that we're in that's trying to impose itself on all the other worlds and extinguish them. So big, big, big questions, metaphysical questions about time and space are a big part of their organizing. And they invite us to make sure that we, 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 we dream big and we think about it all. And so I wanted to show this map so that you can see that that's a different construction of geography. And if you look at the map of um, the Los Angeles, the, the official LA city and the districts, and this is a map of the neighborhood councils within the district. And the one, um, CD14 is the orange one, the, far, the furthest east one. It's the orange one in the middle underneath Pasadena. And as you can see, the, the gerrymandering that's gone on that, that we're quite aware of. And, and the reason why I wanna show this to you is so that we can think about a different way of, of understanding space invite ourselves to think of it differently. And I wanna show you another map uh, that might provoke this. And this is a map of the watersheds of Los Angeles. And what a watershed is, is when, when, when rain falls where you're at, how that rain is gonna to get to the ocean, how it's gonna shed, right? That means that you're in, in the specific watershed where that happens. So there are different watersheds and it's, it's important to, many many people have argued for a long time, Native Americans have been doing this forever, indigenous peoples all over the world, really centering their lives around these really important life-giving resources like water, right? And, and protecting and make sure it's clean because what comes after that is the ability to grow good food and also caring, the, caring for the land allows it for a, a place to be livable create housing. Uh, of course, we'll have to be organized for that, have our justice in, in place, education, health, those kinds of things. That's, that's at the level that they're thinking of. So uh, and you can see here in the dark, for example, if you look at the Los Angeles watershed, it's orange, light orange, but the dark orange parts are those parts that are in the official Los Angeles city boundaries. And you can see that in the green, the Dominguez channel, the darker parts, that's the, that's the district leading down line uh, corridor leading down to San Pedro. And so these are very different ways of understanding space and, and stewarding, stewarding land uh, that, that keeps in mind all of life's giving, life giving processes and how we relate to those in every day. This is another map of Los Angeles, very few of us ever see. And this is a map of where Los Angeles gets its water. And as you can see, it's not bounded to Los Angeles at all. There, there are many aqueducts that have been created to create Los Angeles as we know it. And the Colorado River is really important too. And as you can see, if we're gonna map, have, it, have it, another geography for Los Angeles. There's so many geographies we can have for a city like Los Angeles from the very local to the very global. This is a the very regional, and this is um, another way of understanding how the city runs. So these things are important in, in creating autonomy because when we talk about autonomy, it's really about making our lives different. And what we need to make our lives are clean water, 
nutritious food, you know, um, a place for shelter, community justice, education, health, all of those things. Uh, so I wanted to show you really quickly this um, map again of Zapatista territory because I want you just to, to recall this this word caracol and the zones. Be um, this is a uh, back in 2013, the Zapatistas invited anyone in, in the world who wanted to come, and thousands of us from all over the world went to the little school, which was um, an opportunity for us to live with the Zapatista support bases to see how they construct autonomy, how they build um, their own health clinics and their own schools and their own food processes, their own economies, their own cooperatives. And they broke out this chart and it's in Spanish. And what it says is the structure of autonomous government, the Zapatista communities. And this is at the municipal, in the middle you see M-A-R-E-Z. That's the rebel municipal autonomous areas of the Zapatistas. And they have work areas of education, health, of um, indigenous uh, medicine as well, together with more modern medicine, um, collective work, they also have, uh, they have a local, which is over toward the left that the compa, his, his arm is covering a little bit. That's the local, which is the village level. Every village has an assembly. And then they organize uh, by sending a representative or several representatives to the municipal level, where then they assemble again to uh, make sure that the villages are always kept in the, in the loop. And then... Um, they get uh, moved over sometimes, depending on the scale, to the zonal, the caracol. Uh, so they have the local, the municipal, and the zonal, which resembles a lot the three levels of government of Mexico and the United States and, and many other uh, democracies. And um, we shouldn't forget, though, that the U.S. Constitution in its way of structuring has been very much inspired by Native American governance. So if you see you know, assemblies and, and, and federations and things like that. That's a very native way of, of, of organizing here. It, the difference is that the way that it's been imposed by the U.S., Mexico, and all these other states is by a power circulating in a, in a way that dominates. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Before I do, I just wanted to, then in a more abstract way, this says Caracol for assembly, all members of the autonomous councils and of the seven commissions of the seven municipalities. So there is a zone, zone four. It has it's broken down into seven municipalities and those each municipality has a council and it has commissions, health commissions, education commissions, justice, cooperate, economies, things like that. And they articulate with each other. That's why those arrows are going between the, the big, 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 um, Regional assembly is the dark circle, how it coordinates with all those councils and commissions. Um, but if you look at the bottom as an example of a municipal assembly, that's the 17th of November municipal assembly. And it's the representatives of, of those each have to be accountable to their village, which are the little tiny squares underneath that 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 the, that that oval in the bottom is relating to those little tiny uh, squares underneath. And each one of those are local assemblies that then move on to municipal to zonal. And then the zones, again, there's not a headquarters. The zones coordinate amongst each other. And they do things differently too. There's no imposing one way. Every context is different. What matters is this. Uh, I'll come back to that. What matters is the way power circulates. This is the uh, uh, one of the greatest contributions um, that I think the Zapatistas and, and the Maya uh, today are, are offering us in how to dismantle empire, how to move towards liberation. Uh, what they teach us, uh, and they're not the only ones, um, we see this from the Black radical tradition a lot all over the place. Um, they teach us about how the dominant world, the colonial world, the capitalist world, is structured by a logic of above and below. And what that means is that whenever there is difference, there always we're taught that we always have to measure ourselves with the other. Are we superior or are we inferior to this other? And there's always like this competition over who's going to be better and who's not. And it always means crushing somebody else. It, doesn't mean cooperating. It means 
measuring ourselves against somebody else in a negative way. And we learn this in everyday life. And one of the big places we learn this is in school. We're ranked all of the time as a good student or a bad student. And that really does a lot to us and who we, how, we, how we understand ourselves and our possibilities and our potentials. Every time we come across different phenotypes, someone who looks different, we're taught to rank. There's already an established ranking from colonialism that European is on top and African is, is below. And then in the middle, right? Maybe, maybe some of us can assimilate or maybe some of us can stay in the middle and just not be fully below. But we're taught we always need to crush others in order to live in this society. And we're also taught to, taught to crush ourselves because in the process of having to you know, figure out like how we are in the world vis-a-vis -vis someone else, uh, our self-esteem constantly takes a toll. So many mental health struggles because of this kind of, of, of way of living. And so power in above below is circulating in a way that is dominating those above exert power over those below. And what the Zapatistas want to do is not fall into that trap, which as we know, a lot of the time our movements fall into that trap. I will, I, um, I, I, I also accompany the Palestinian struggle and lived in Palestine for a bit um, because I was so confused. I wanted to know what was happening. And especially because it's victims of the Holocaust of genocide that are now Domin uh, dominating other folks. And I, I, I see this logic everywhere that the only option we're given if we're oppressed is to go above and oppress somebody else. And with the Zapatistas and other native movements in Mexico and around the world, I say, no, we do not want to replicate that way of relating. We want to relate differently. We want to relate in a dignified way where power is dispersed, there isn't this domination, and everybody can be who they want to be. They don't have to measure up to a standard of whatever we're supposed to be. So instead of doing the above and below, they do the side by side. And, and they talk, and, the, and it's the Zapatista women in particular who um, have developed this uh, publicly in, in the way that they talk about gender. Uh, in Mesoamerican philosophy, in the Maya world, um, Gender is really just a, an adjective. It's not a structural position of superiority and inferiority. And um, the way that the women talk is they don't want to reverse those positions where women are above and men are below and are being oppressed. No, they don't want to keep that. They want to be side by side, walking side by side, not trying to be like men, right? Like a more liberal feminism would and not trying to destroy men, like the, just the reversal of domination domination is preserved and the cycle just continues. It just looks different now. Uh, Malcolm X very famously, um, but sadly not talked about enough. In his last year when he went to Africa, he talks a lot about, you know, in meeting Algerians who had just successfully beat out the French in an anti-colonial war that lasted a century almost, uh, or well, well over a century, a million martyrs war. Uh, and, and these are people marked as white, they're Arab, depending on context. In the United States, for sure, marked as white. He meets the ambassador to Algeria in Ghana while he's being hosted by Kwame Nkrumah uh, and is stunned to see like, wow, this is a, a white man, but he's a revolutionary. I don't know what to do with that. And he starts making the distinction between white adjective just white, you just, that's just your adjective versus white, I'm the boss. That's a structural position. In the United States, both of them are put together. And the task then is to split them apart where we can just be ourselves in our adjective, beautiful adjective differences and not a structural position where anyone's above anybody else. And this is um, just the last slide really quick so we could chat. Um, they have this power flow and they have principles that they agree on. That's the commonality. What it looks like on the ground is gonna look different because every context is different. And a great contribution they've given us is this concept of leading by obeying. It comes from one of the native people's cosmovisions, the Tojolabal people. The Zapatistas are made up of many different native peoples and they have borrowed this concept from one of, one of their communities who is sharing it with the world, uh, instead of, of, of commanding, 
having our leaders command and we obey. Our leaders need to obey us. They mean the assembly. And that's actually how it's taught in school, except that it's not in practice, right? And so what they have is seven principles to remind, to remind uh, themselves and all of us in their space, you know, how we treat each other. We're gonna treat each other with respect. If you're in a leadership position, you serve. You do not serve yourself. If you're in a representative position, you, rep you actually represent the word of the assembly. You do not replace the word with your word of the assembly. Build, not destroy. Everything is toward that building. For sure, destroying the dominant world by delinking from it, from not asking it for things, because a lot of the time, the way that the dominant world, most of the power it has is by us wanting to be a part of it. A lot of the power it has is for sure violent confrontation, but so much of it is everyday life. We're so into the capitalist um, and, and into the, the capitalist rat race that we're just begging to be part of it because we don't have an alternative to get out of it. Uh, so for sure, like keep building this new world so that the, the dominant one is not relevant to our lives. It doesn't have legitimacy in our lives. Obey, don't command. And again, this is if you're in a leadership position, you obey the assembly, you do not command the assembly. It's not for the assembly to obey. This is, again, these principles are for those in a leadership position. Propose, don't impose. So if you have an idea, instead of saying, this is how we're going to do it, let's do it. I have a proposal. How about this? Convince, don't defeat. This is something that um, I think would be really helpful in a lot of our debates, uh, especially amongst those of us like on the left, like there's a lot of fragments and stuff, but there's a lot of points of, of, of commonality. And if we can get into conversations and, and keeping in mind, let's try to convince each other rather than defeat each other. And then go below, don't go above. So that above and below flow, stay below, don't ever go above anybody, don't crush anybody else. And actually the idea is while we're in this world of above and below, to stay with the below, to be able to escape out, escape out to create another world of side by side. And if you go into the dominant world, it's just to pull resources. It's to it's for harm reduction or it's for subversion. It's not your world. It's the world that's there. And we need resources sometimes to pull out and go outside and create something else. And the key is to have that outside though. If we don't have that outside, we just get swept back in into that same. Um, I'll, I'll stop it there, but I want to just go back to this, um, this slide. This slide is of a book called Kuslehal Politics by Mariana Mora, which is um, fairly new, just a couple years old. And it, and, and it, and it has um, a couple, of, it has that map and also that diagram of the assembly. And what's really great, it, it talks a lot about, uh, about these ideas at the level of like high philosophical, metaphysical theory, down to the more concrete, like everyday stuff. And also talks about her as a researcher who was working on her PhD, because this was her dissertation, how she needed to get permission from the Zapatista communities for her to do per, uh, her research there. And like, and she traces like the entire process that went that it went through to even get assembly consensus. Uh, so it's really helpful for um, for us to learn about how the Zapatistas actually work. And also for anyone wanting to do research with movements and struggle, like how to, how to have a relationship with them with where, where our work is supporting their struggle and not just getting me a PhD or just getting me tenure or whatever, which they told her in the book and she writes about it. So I'll leave it there. I see that there's a couple um, notes in the chat. Let's make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, Martin to each according to their needs. And Leonardo's got like exclamation, exclamation, exclamation on that. Mm, cool. That's it. If we all, if we want to have QA, I don't know, maybe this helps spark some thoughts. Thank you, Kiki. Um, any thoughts? Uh, oh, we should, questions? we should share the presentation too, right? Oh, yeah. I was going to ask about that, yes. <laughs> Let's put that in the chat and then we can add that to the notes. And then uh, Sua has her hand up and Leonardo has her hand up. Sua, if you want to go ahead. 
Thank you, Leonardo. It's probably going to make you smile because what I'm about to say. I have a lot of tension around men in power, and I want to understand how we, we're not there yet, especially here in the U.S. And while I have a lot of respect for colegas with shared vision, um, I think in practice, it isn't, it's still, it's really challenging for mujeres. Uh, um, so I just wonder ways in which we can identify and address those things through like love, I guess. <laughs> and if there's ways of uh, gaining capacity on both ends to do that, I mean, I particularly have a lot of triggers around men, especially men that are put in power regardless. And so I just want to understand that a little bit more. Thank you so much for, for that, Sua. Um, yeah, it's real, it's real. Mm, something that is a really important lesson from, from the work of the Compas in Chiapas is, is understanding power flows and then seeing what the context of the power flow is. Is, is dominate, okay, domination is taking place. What are the identities that are being managed in this context? And under patriarchy, the identities that are being managed are the gendered ones where male is above and non-male is below. So the ones who have the rights are above and the ones with the responsibilities below, uh, as an example. Uh, and that happens in contexts of patriarchy. And it is really important for folks to caucus out, to talk about it, to see how, they, how, how we can organize that. With the, with, yeah, with the Zapatista women, they caucus out quite a bit. They have their own women's collectives. And actually the book is really good because it has a whole section on the women, on the women, women's collectives, how they're still, um, it's not a perfect situation at all in Chiapas. And that's actually really important for us to know because if we come in thinking that we need to create something perfect and it doesn't turn out perfect, a lot of the time we can give up. It is for sure uh, a process of walking together. The uh, the, they also have the, the women's right, the women's law that came out, um, actually happened in 1993 on International Women's Day in May. Well, like well before, nine months before the uprising in 1994 against the government. And they call that their internal, we had to have an internal uprising against patriarchy before we could actually fight the government, right? Um, and they have their law and it's something that the women can point to. Um, they also don't do binaries. They also have space for, for growth and for, for uh, gender non-conforming compas and things like that. And, but it is triggering and it's something that, that we need to talk about. And also talking about it, it's not that way in every single context. Like sometimes I've seen, I've seen women or, you know, organize their lives where they have their male partners, like as their servants, kind of like trying to do away with patriarchy, but keeping the relation of domination intact. And so that's something to, to also keep in mind while also um, being really clear. Yeah, we're in a context of patriarchy in a context of patriarchy, males are above, non-males are below. Something key to is seeing how this also is enormous violence on males, on all of us, not just not just those of us getting beat up, but we're internally crushing ourselves in this system too. Yeah, I mean, something parallel to what Sua was saying. Um, I, I think we need to keep in mind that this is a, a process that has taken a long time to get there. And it's also about the meeting of different experiences. You know, the Zapatista movement stands in 1983. And, and it's not the indigenous communities the, the developing this, this model and this practice, but also urban guerrillas and Marxist Leninists who are like being transformed by this process. So it is about a mutual transformation and it has like 40 years of existence. Uh, so I, I think we need to keep that in mind. That's why I'm, I'm, I think it's very, very important to understand that if we're committed to this stuff, we're talking about a process where all of us have to relearn and unlearn a lot of things. And uh, I think that's the biggest obstacle. Uh, I come from an organization that's taken us 26 years to develop. We're not perfect. We're not the best organization in the world, but we've learned a lot in the process of committing to a to long-term issue and a long-term of doing the work. And uh, in organization, the majority are women 
Um, I still have a strong leadership role, and, and I think so I would have critique on that. But I mean, we're getting there. And, and I just want us to understand that um, this is not the end, and we need to be very, very clear on this process. Uh, the, there is a, the, the model, the ideal that we have in front of us is something that we're trying to move, move towards, but it's not going to happen overnight. And there's going to be a lot of problems, especially when we're in the United States, where we are pushed towards individualism, where capitalism is strong, and where there's a lot of fear about these kinds of processes, and where there's a lot of bad habits that have been developed by nonprofits. So we, um, I, I mean, I like it. I like the idea, model and the idea that this is what we're going for, and uh, but also understand that uh, it's not going to happen overnight. And, and uh, sorry, and by the way, and that goes to the territory, territory thing. I understand when we started Union de Vecinos, we started focused on e electoral precincts. And very soon we discovered that community has its own way of organizing itself. And we need to adapt and organize to that and, and depend on that. But we had to have a point of departure. And that's why I would argue in favor of CD14 understanding that it will fall to pieces once we start, once the community takes leadership on this process. Mm. Yeah, it's it, it is really key to to understand the long it's a long path. It's 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 actually living differently. It's a way of life. It's totally yeah, it's a it's a commitment for for generations, no? Um because that's exactly what they're trying to do is protect and give and allow life, a dignified life for future generations. And it is a big process of transformation. So much of what we learn and what we have learned if we came went to these schools here in this in this society we 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 need to unlearn a lot of things that we've learned and, and be open to being wrong being very humble and that's that's who the zapatistas were the first six zapatistas did come from a marxist leninist org in mexico but they stopped being marxist leninist after humbling down and realizing Oh shoot, we're not, we don't have the answers up here to tell everybody what to do, which is a very Marxist Leninist, like the elite uh, party or the intellectuals, they're gonna tell everybody what to do. They realize, wow, these communities are already organized. They've been organizing from forever. And especially because liberation theology, like the idea of not imposing the word of God, but finding the word of God in the already existing practices of the communities. That's very oh. much the, the different power relation here. Uh, it, it takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of us who thought, you know, who think we know things uh, to be okay not knowing and to be okay being wrong and also stepping back. You had your hand up, Phil Conta, right? Yeah, I wanted to um, just ask kind of any, if anybody has responses to um, what Kiki shared about geography, rethinking geography. Um, that can maybe like also help us along with um, continuing that conversation um, about the assembly and participation um, and like how how voices are going to be heard. Um, and so, um, so yeah, just putting it out there, um, Yvonne. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, that was, thank you so much, Kiki, for the presentation. That was really beautiful. Um, I mean, I just appreciate how it was, it was, you know, so on so many different levels, you know, um, and it's very, it's, it's a, it's a very inspiring um, message that I sort of am learning that I'm walking away with. Um, I think, I think I didn't, you know, so I didn't know on, enough about the catacolis and the assembly model of government that the Zapatistas practice and I'm fascinated about that and I want to learn more and I think that like this is maybe the work that the research and education group can do just explore these different models like they have them in Barcelona they have them in um I mean we we heard from um you, there's just so many different models. I think it's so really cool to like be able to, like here's the one that has more information about Barcelona. For instance, Fearless Cities, there's a, a free book that you can download about that. I think it'd be great if maybe we could use like this, maybe the weekly meeting space time to invite someone to maybe share a model with us. It, ideally, it could be a guest speaker from the model or one of us could kind of read up on it and share it with us um, as an idea. 
Um, as far as the question that Chris posed, what do we think about, you know, geography? I think that would be a really interesting exercise to lead one of our first few assemblies through the process of having folks define, you know, what is our community, like some sort of, you know, mapping exercise. Um, you know, maybe it is a watershed or maybe, you know, um, maybe it's something else. Great. Um, yeah, we'll put that link in the into the notes for sure. And um, I like the idea of of um, continuing with this sort of um, flow of um, learning about different models. Definitely. Um, Brenda, hands your hand up. Okay, Brenda. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um... Thank you, Kiki, for presenting that. Um, just wanted to echo what everyone said. This is a great presentation. And um, I really liked when we really zoomed out <laughs> from Los Angeles to see like where, where we actually are. The bigger picture is always um, relevant when we're trying to figure out the, the very um, nitty gritty, like the details. So um, that was refreshing. And I am interested in like getting together with a group and identifying like the resources in this area and seeing what's relevant, what's characteristic of the area. So um, I don't know if that's like a committee or just like a meeting or, or what, but I'd like to explore that more with this group. Uh, I think Yvonne uh, uh, pointed out that there was uh, the research committee that, um, may, I mean, this may, you know, this crosses a lot of uh, different committees, but uh, at this point, uh, the research committee is doing some, uh, or can be doing some of this work. So maybe that's a committee you might be interested in getting in, uh, Brenda. So I, I wanted to say that um, this is a, a totally uh, new way of looking at ourselves. Um, and, uh, uh, looking at who we are, uh, where we're at. And um, I really, I really enjoyed the presentation. I loved it. And um, I did want to uh, ask Kiki if she could, you know, say a few words about, uh, I think what uh, Yvonne alluded to and, and Leonardo in terms of uh, the urban setting and the differences. And, you know, when we look at a model or an example, maybe uh, more than a model. Um, you know, we could look at it more as an example than a model. But, but go ahead, Kiki. Yeah, the question about the urban set setting is really, it's a really live question. A lot of us who visit Zapatista territory in their encounters or the CNI assembly spaces, a lot of us come from urban contexts whether it's in Mexico or other parts of the world or in the United States. And our question is always, well, their question for us is how are you organizing where you're at? And then, you know, we have to figure out how do, how do we build autonomy in a city? And it's such a difficult, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, the challenge is that cities under capitalism are built so that the city uh, is valued over the countryside. And so there's a lot of destruction of the countryside and other people's worlds there. And a lot of the time, we don't know that if we grow up in a city and that's mostly all we know, like we don't really know where the water comes, just the tap, you know, the food, peaches come from a can. Like we don't really understand too much about mother earth in that way. And with autonomy, autonomy is about, uh, in, in this context, in their context, in the context many of us use it, autonomy is a collective process of world building, of shifting to a different world where you're not dependent, you're not forced, you're not hostage, you're not captive in the dominant one. It's totally, it keeps us captive whether we are above or below. Those are captive positions. Some have more privilege than others, but they're both captive. And so autonomy is being able to live a life without that. And so much of that structure, it looks very abstract on the slide and it's very helpful to have the abstraction, but I encourage us all 
uh, anytime we can to see, uh, to try to map out how our lives are made, where are all the forces that go into place for like, for me to have this pen, for example, and then you start to track how, how that, that power differential plays itself out, especially on, on Mother Earth. So for those of us in the cities, we have a responsibility of we're building autonomy to build a different relationship with the countryside that is more dignified, that has the countryside also side by side that has Mother Earth also side by side, not, not below, not above, and all that. Uh, something that I know we can start on, and, 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 and I know of folks who have access to land. I was in, in Europe last year with the Zapatistas. They're traveling all five continents, and they started with Europe, and they'll be in Africa. They haven't said when, and they'll be in Asia. They haven't said, they'll be in the United States. They haven't said when. Uh, we, but we went to, uh, in France, there's a liberated zone, an autonomous zone there called the ZAD, and they have um, a lot of land, and they gave us, and they've been there for decades, and they had an encounter there, they gave us a tour, and they told us, we have so much, we have our housing, we have our food, our water, but what we can't, what we don't have, and we can't figure out is justice, we don't have community justice, and that is something we can start working on now, even if we don't have access to land. Questions of transformative justice, restorative, whatever we call it, right? Which is really just about how we're relating to each other. It's about building trust, having a community, having that space where we don't have to call the cops. You know, we don't want to call the cops, but then what do we do when something happens? Like we don't have an alternative for that, which then makes it so that people keep calling the cops when something happens. So it really is, um, there's a lot of things that we can do in an urban setting to start building autonomy and, and a lot of those things are about housing, but to really have a different relationship where we break from that above below and we really are in dignified relation with everyone, every being, then we really need to figure out what our relationship is going to be with the, with the countryside that the city depends on so much. Oh, and just one more thing, if I may, since I have the mic, because I have it on my on my notes, I wanted to, um, because we talk about above and below, the Zapatistas use this phrase, um, uh, from the left, from below and to the left. They sign off their communiques a lot, from below and to the left. And this is a term, and, and I've heard it in this meeting, like we're leftists, like we want to make sure, like the right, we, and this is it's really important for us, I think, at this moment, especially to define what we mean by left, because as we know, in the United States, left can mean liberal, mean Democratic Party, whereas in the rest of the world, it means anti-capitalist. Uh, with the Zapatistas, I think that what they what they mean about the left is for sure an anti-capitalism. But if we look at there's a below and to the right as well. And that is the organized, like the Trump popular base that he was able to mobilize. They want to go above. They don't want to stay below. They want to go above. They're from the right. And from the right, the way I define it, they do not respect difference. They do not respect difference. They want to go above and impose their way on everybody else, right? They're below, but they want to go above and impose. There are many of us who are below who are oppressed and who want to go above. And that is what we need to resist. We need to resist going into their world and replicating and becoming them, becoming the monsters we fight. To the left, anti-capitalist, and it's also respectful of difference. To me, those are the things that the way I define left, that you respect difference. Because there's also a left from above, which is Soviet Union, China, you know, these countries that are anti-capitalist, but they're still from above. They don't necessarily respect difference. They're just talking an anti-capitalist game, but replicating the same stuff. Thank you. That's very important. <laughs> Time check. Time check is, yeah, one hour and a half exactly ish uh, so i mean i think um i think that's uh pretty much wraps it up for us um, so a reminder we'll be meeting as facilitator for this facilitator group tomorrow at seven um and something that i'd like to propose to that group yeah below and to the left that's right mm -hmm. who i see that's right geography just please please 
we 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 must give ourselves permission to question everything, including time and space. Right, these huge things. Um, and um, something that I'd like to talk more about tomorrow in our facilitator meeting is of how we're going to relate to the assembly, like how like maybe we can adopt some of these principles for really so we don't supplant the word the word of the assembly, right? We really represent it when we're reflecting back. Things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's tomorrow I said. Okay, also, um, because since we started a little bit late, I think we have two more minutes um, to ask one more question. Um, just to show, like, to mirror how the commonalities in our movements, like with the Jackson Cooperative um, and the beautiful example of their uh, synthesizers, I when I heard that in Mike's presentation, I thought of... Um, the in the zapatista practice they have what they call escuchas um people who listen those who are assigned to be in meeting spaces to listen um so um and is there anything that you could speak to on that that you um know yeah i know a little bit about that and that was uh, yeah i've seen the i've seen them take notes they've done that to us when they asked us to assemble they just listen and don't say anything and and i always wonder oh my god what are they saying about us you know <laughs> i hope good things um that's a really important practice the um and and i saw and i've and i saw it in a communique when the scientist they invited scientists a couple of years to come and use science for rebellion and resistance and not for capitalism and having a conversation about that. And they invite, the Zapatistas invited people from their bases of support, from the villages, and they came into the assembly. It was an open assembly to the world. And they came in and sat in the front. And the scientists kept kind of like wondering, hey, how come they're not asking us questions? How come they're not asking us questions? And turns out that they were um, taking notes. And then what they do is that they assemble afterward and check each other's notes. Oh, this is what I heard. Is this what you heard? And this is what you heard. And so I'm thinking like with the with the synthesizers, that reminded me of that. Yeah, and, and I think too, like for the facilitators, as we as you all meet tomorrow, um, something good to keep in mind um, in preparation for the assembly. Um, Lauren has a question. Yes, so then um, for next meeting, so based off of what we had proposed last time, the note takers would be the facilitator. Um, but do we want to rotate that? Well, no? Yvonne, Yvonne ended up taking notes. It sounds, I'm sorry, Yvonne. Sure. I didn't have my computer, so I... So then, yeah, let's pick someone else. So Yvonne, that means you, you would not want to facilitate the next meeting. <laughs> I'm happy to facilitate, but I don't know if somebody else would like to. Who hasn't had a turn, Brenda? <laughs> I'm just like not available the whole time because of the theater. Okay. So like I, I go in and out, sorry. You're not I miss series of meetings, but uh, I, I I can volunteer to get, play catch up. Can we exchange emails so we can follow with each other? Yeah, yeah, we're on Signal. Oh, I that's think. right. We're on no, the facilitation group. Okay, yeah. good. Tomorrow we'll just, that's right. Good. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, note takers. Thank you, everyone. Um, for your word and for your ear. Um, we can pretty much say good night. Thank you. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Buenas you. noches. I'll leave it on for a few minutes if anybody needs to click on links. But it looks like everyone's good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We did it, Gumbo!